Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm hoping now that for the fourth time we are starting this and we've I'm we still and we're still live. Okay, we're still live. Good, that's good news. Forget okay. Forget about that. Okay, here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, I've Abba Perlman is live. Can you thing in? Show me if someone could tell me. Ah, we go. Okay, now we're in business. Now, it took us 15 minutes, but this was a little hiccup. This was a little, little hiccup. I hope that everybody can now join in. Thank you for your patience. I really appreciate your patience. You know, myself, I am a little technically disadvantaged. So I don't know what happened, but it's a challenge. And when it's a challenge, what do you do? Ah, thank you, Melissa. Thank you for showing up. All good. All right. Okay, here we are. So let's take it from the top. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Rabbi Perlmutter, you're on. Okay, good evening. And thank you for joining me, my friends, tonight for another session of Towards a Meaningful Life. You know, this is a six-part series. We've already done three parts. Tonight is number four. Which means, which means that half of your life should already be meaningful. Half of your life should already be meaningful. And we'll see within the next three weeks if we can make your entire life meaningful. But at least we got you going for at least half, half of your life. Okay. Now, I know that some people are coming on tonight that, for whatever reason, did not check into our first three sessions. So what I'm going to do is... I'm just going to go for a quick recap. First quick recap of the th first three sessions of Towards a Meaningful Life. In lesson number one, in lesson number one, we talked about worthiness. You are worthy. We established that you matter. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, you make a difference. Okay? That was lesson number one. Just to give you some build up your self-esteem, because if you're going to go out there, and try to live a meaningful life, you're going to need to feel good about yourself. If you're going to be down and out and sad, it's not going to work. So first lesson number one is you matter. God loves you and you make a difference in this world, regardless if there's 7 billion people or 70 billion people, you are unique. And lesson number two, we talked about love and relationships, how towards a meaningful life. If you want to live a meaningful life, you need to have that person that that, that that partner, that friend that makes your life whole. We talked about a half a heart, and when you find your spouse, ah, oh, it's as if you, con you, you, you connected. That was lesson number two. Lesson number three was last week when we turned our house into a home. How do you do that? A house which has four walls and a roof and other, other room rooms in the house, but that's not a house. That's a house, but that's not a home. A home is where you live and you feel comfortable and it gives you emotional equilibrium. It makes you feel strong and secure and safe. That's a home. It makes everybody around you feel the same way. And tonight we are going to attack and discuss two other important topics. Money, money. Who doesn't love money? Money and work. How to make those two ideas, money and work, work. <laughs> Work towards making your life more meaningful. Okay. So let's tackle work first. Let's talk about work first. And when I say the wor about work, I don't only mean those people that are gainfully employed and go to work every day and, and get a job and have a job and get a paycheck at the end. Work could mean anything, anything that you do, volunteer, et cetera, et cetera outside of leisure. When you're sitting around like this, that's not working. But when you're out of the house doing something, serving somebody, any, any way you do it, whether you get paid or you don't get paid, that's work. All right? So I just want to give you a, a definition of what we're talking about over here. But of course, most people will think of work as having a job and just going out there and you know, getting a paycheck. The interesting thing that we find when it comes to work is when most people are asked whether they would retire 
if they had enough money to live on for the rest of their lives, most people said, no, they would not. They would keep working. Now, at first glance, this is so counterintuitive. Is it not, ladies and gentlemen? Is it not counterintuitive? Because it seems so strange that people would feel this way when, if you ask them about their job, they talk about alienation. They feel so alienated at work. They feel so bored at work, frustrated, scared that they're going to be laid off, and they can't wait to retire, can't wait to retire, or at least, if they can't retire so quickly, at least win the lottery, at least win the lottery, right? That's number one. A lot of people feel this way. I mean, Henry David Thoreau wrote that the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation, quiet desperation. So here, so again, going back to the first question of would you retire, and they said no, it, it seems very strange that they would feel the same way while they're working. Secondly, when people are asked, why do you work? Why are you working? Most people will give you this look as if you asked a strange question, and then they'll say, I work because I need to earn money to pay bills. That's why I work. Why does anybody work? Because they need money to pay bills. Oi, you remember the song from Fiddler on the Roof, don't you, when Tevye starts to sing, Oi, if I were a rich man. All day long, I cheery berry bum, if I was a wealthy man. And then he says, I wouldn't have to work hard. Ah, who wouldn't want that? If we had all the money, we wouldn't have to work hard. Imagine this, ladies and gentlemen. You have no bosses, no bosses, no annoying customers, no backstabbing coworkers, no long hours. You know what? When people think that way, some people even tell me in Shul, if they didn't have to go to work and have all of these difficulties, they may come to Shul on Shabbos. Well, imagine that. So I'm asking you, if this is true, about work and how we feel about work, why is it that most people, when asked if they would retire, say, no, they're not going to retire. They're not going to retire, even if they didn't have to worry about paying the bills. So till now, we've been talking about the negative side of having what we call a job. But let's think about, ladies and gentlemen, just for a moment, let's discuss the positive side of having a job and of work, right? Certain benefits come out of it. Number one is, imagine if you had nothing to do all day, you, how bored you would be. You'd be climbing the walls. We know this because, you know, when we had COVID and people were stuck at home and they were gonna go, going out of their minds, out of their minds. So number one is having a job avoids boredom. At least you get up in the morning, you go to work. Ah, oh, thank God you're at work. Great, 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 great. Fine, wonderful. We avoid boredom, which you may say is not such a great thing. But think about it. If When you're sitting at home twiddling your thumbs, it's a big, 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 big thing. Number two, also, we feel a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. Well, those that are in work and have a wonderful attitude towards work and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor, if you're an accountant, if you happen to be a city worker, you happen to be a teacher, you happen to be on, a, on an assembly line. It, it, it doesn't, that doesn't matter what kind of work. If you come in with the right attitude, you have a feeling of a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction. I'm gonna just read you a little story that's, you know, that, that goes around talking about this very, very, very idea, okay? In the days of misty towers, distressed maidens, and stalwart knights, years ago, a young man walking down a road came upon a laborer, fiercely pounding away at a stone with hammer and chisel. The lad asked the worker, who looked frustrated and angry, Why are you, what are you doing? The laborer answered in a pained voice, I'm trying to shape this stone and it's back-breaking work. The youth continued his journey and soon came upon another man chipping away at a similar stone. 
who looked neither particularly angry or happy. What are you doing? He asked. I'm shaping a stone for a building. The young man went on and before long came to a third man, chipping away at a stone. But this worker was singing happily as he worked. What are you doing? The lad asked. And the worker smiled and repiled, replied, I'm building a cathedral. Oh my gosh, I'm building a cathedral. So here were three people who were doing basically the same job. They were chopping away at a stone, trying to shape it. One guy had an attitude of anger and frustration. The other guy had an attitude of apathy. But it was the third guy that thought to himself that he is in the midst of doing something great. He is in the midst of an accomplishment. He is building a cathedral. So those people that go to work with this kind of an attitude, regardless of what they do, regardless of what they do, feel a tremendous sense of accomplishment at work. Number three, the social interaction. Not everybody has backstabbing coworkers. There are many people that have wonderful, wonderful coworkers. They love their customers. They appreciate and respect their bosses. So you know what? We know this through COVID. You know, when you have to go online and deal with, uh, you know, going on Zoom and all of that, it's not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same as when coming into an office and you're interacting with people. You know, you're you're forming relationships with people in the office. Great friendships, you know, happen from all of these things. That's tremendous benefit of, of having so- somewhere to go. Can you imagine? You feel important. Only you can do this job. And again, regardless, this could be a plumbing job. This can be a teaching job. This can be a construction job. It can be any type of job. The fact that you are doing it gives you importance, importance, significance. It, you know, it makes you feel that you are you are somebody, you know, especially if you have a good team of co-workers that are working on a project. Like, you know, let's say you're working at, you know, at a, at a high tech industry or a space industry, whatever it is, and you're on a team and you're building and you're an engineer. You know what? To, 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 to make a bridge takes hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people. And you are one of those people. But you know what? The job that you did is very important. Imagine the guy that had to span up the bridge and, you know, he, he was short by a few yards. Doesn't, you know, it's not that, it's not that good. Challenging, you know, if you have a job that's challenging. And again, uh, you know, we're not talking about mathematics challenging. Any job can be challenging. You know, you have a route that you have to cover. That's challenging because you have to figure out the best way, the most expedient way to do the job. You know, not, so it's it's challenging, it keeps our minds, so especially if you have a job that you have to think a lot. You know, it's it's challenging and that's part of being human is being challenged. And when you overcome that challenge, again, you get that great sense of satisfaction. You get to use your talents, hopefully. So, you know, if you're good in mathematics or, you know, if you're good, if you're a wonderful teacher or if you happen to be, you know, let's just a very patient person, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're a therapist, whatever it is, you get to use your talents in a job. And you know what happens when you get to use your talents and you have a job that pays? Oh, come on. That's, that's almost, you, you've won, that's almost like winning the lottery. So if you are a talented musician and you are able to make a living and pay your bills, pay your bills by playing music, what better is that? How can you get better in life than that? That means never going to work. I remember meeting people that run big industry, big companies, and I said to them, you know, how's your job? The man respect. I never worked a day in my life because I love what I do. I come every day to work, and I'm challenged, and I get to meet great people. I know what? I use my talents, and that gives me the greatest satisfaction. It's, there's no job here. It's a labor of love, a labor of love. You know what? When you do a good job, and if you have a good boss and good coworkers, you know, or whatever, you get appreciated. Imagine a good teacher at the end of the year, she gets notes from her students. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Perlmutter, for the great job that you did in educating our children. And she gets the, the notes from the, you know, from, from her students. Thank you, Mrs. Perlmutter, for a wonderful year. I learned so much in your class. Wow. How significant do you feel at that time? Maybe during the year it was a little frustrating because you had to, you know, get them to behave and all of that. But at the end of the year, when you're able to take them from point A to point B, you know, before they couldn't read and now they could read, before they couldn't do division, now they could do division. And they thank you. They thank you for, for a job well done. Oh, 
how you feel like a million dollars. Where else are you going to get that kind of significance? Now, that's a job. Yes, it's a job. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You don't care. You don't call that a job. This is something that you that is absolutely you, 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 you run to to do this. And ladies and gentlemen, all of these things that I've mentioned before is all up here. You can have all of these things, social interaction, sense of accomplishment, feeling important, challenges, talents, significance, then the opportunity to learn new things, maybe even to travel. And if your attitude is, 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 is sour, none of these are going to help you. But if you're in this class and you're listening to me this evening on a Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock here in Southern California, and you want to, yes, you really, really want to live a meaningful life, all of these things will make a tremendous difference in how you do your job. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're getting a paycheck or you're not getting a paycheck. You could be volunteering at the JCC. You could be volunteering at some at, 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 at a shelter. It doesn't matter. If you come with this attitude that I am doing something important, that it's giving me significance, that I'm, I'm, I'm appreciated by people, and I appreciate people, you know what? Then all of a sudden, the job is not, a, it's not burdensome. It's not burdensome. It's something that you like to do. And then, of course, comes the important part. Why do you go to work? Money, money. I like to check at the end of the week. It pays, and if it's a good job, and you're talented, and you're in the right place, you can get a lot of money. If you're someone that's willing to take a challenge, and you're a risk taker, and you're a, a visionary, then all of a sudden, the world is going to pay you a ton of money. If you have a talent that nobody has, you know, whether look, look at these ball players. Ball players got paid tens of millions of dollars. You know why? Because no one else can do it. You only have a few select people that can that can play basketball at this level. You only have a few select people that are musicians at this level and will pay you millions and millions of dollars. And for those entrepreneurs that are willing to take a risk, well, who who cares? Some people say, you know what, Rambai? You know, too many people are making too much money. You know, they have. Uh, the millions and some have billions and some have more than billions you know it's greedy but think about this ladies and gentlemen think about this for a moment if it weren't for people that were willing to take a risk and to go out there in the in, in, in the world and say to themselves you know what i think there is something i can do to create a a a, a, a contraption that i'll sit here and somebody will sit in the next room i'll pick up our receiver and speak to that person in the next room. And everybody go, yeah, wait, well, you're nuts, Bell. Wait, well, you're crazy or something. It's never, it's never going to happen. Guess what? It happened. And not only did it happen, a, a, a little while later, we end up with this contraption. Okay? So from that, that, that first phone call, we end up here, which our whole lives are in this contraption. And what about this contraption here? What about this? An iPhone. How about, how about Steve Jobs thinking to himself that he's going to get at music in this little thing called an, an, an iPad, whatever it was, was called over there, and an iPad. And, and before that, these are visionaries that are willing to step out. I mean, electric cars, we, we think, hey, electric cars, it's crazy. But now people are driving electric cars. We're talking about now driverless cars. Oh, no, no, driver, there'll be driver, driverless cars soon. Why? Because there's a certain amount of people that don't take this as a job, they take this as a challenge. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs fail. They, they fail. But think about all of the things, all of the conveniences that you have today was only because somebody, somebody had a vision and was willing to put his life and money and reputation and work ethic on the line to do that. From the light bulb to the computer, to a plastic cup, to a telephone, everything that we have of your indoor plumbing, heating and air conditioning, everything. So... I'm okay with, with those kind of people. They, they're getting paid. They're getting paid. Because you know what? You know what? If we benefit from it, good for them. They did it honestly. You know, they did it honestly. I'm not talking about people that steal thieves. But if they did it honestly, they fill a need. And once you fill a need for people and you're willing to and to get paid for it, and we're willing to pay you, gamzul the It's okay. No problem. Adam Smith. The, 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 you know, the great, the great economic thinker, the great economic philosopher wrote, you know, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner. 
but from the regard to their own interest. Well, yeah, I, I, and I understand that. I appreciate that the butcher is not the, nice, the nicest guy in town, but there's a need. He fills the need. No problem. No problem. No. So you know what? So even money, even for the fact that someone says, you know what? I'm in my job to make money. Okay. It could still be meaningful. Doesn't have to be greedy or you don't have to be called a shyster or something like that. You know, it could still be very, very, very meaningful. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is from the perspective of, 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 of the secular world. So in the secular world, we've touched upon a number of ideas that if you are able to tap into them, you will take your job and instead of being Mr. Grouch and all of these things that we talked about before, about the bosses and the customers and the co-workers and the late hours and flip it and say to myself, hey, you know what? My goal in life is to live a meaningful life. Many of my hours that I spend are outside of the home, going to work, having a job, interacting with people. So I can do one of two things. I could either say to myself, you know what? I'm miserable and every day make everyone around me miserable, which then will lead to you coming home and making those people miserable as well. Or you can say to yourself, Rabbi Perlmutter tonight went through a series, nine different uh, ideas of how to make my job more significant, more fun, more meaningful. And I try to int and integrate some of those ideas, whether it's the significance, whether it's the talent, whether whatever it is into that. And that's a, that's a, from a secular standpoint out there. You don't have to be a religious person, you know, to buy this, eth this work ethic, but that would make your job so much more beneficial both for you and when you walk out of the office, you feel better, you come home, you feel even better, and then everybody around you feels great. Oh, what does the Torah, what's the Torah's perspective on work? What does the Torah have to say on this idea that we call work? Well, I have to tell you, if you look in the book of Job, well, the book of Job is not exactly the happiest and lightest book there is in the Bible. Let's be honest, Job is a wonderful man that gets challenged and challenged in a way that is just incredibly difficult. He loses almost everything, okay? What happened? In Job it says, Adam la'amul yulav, and man was born to toil, meaning that man was born in order to work, and not only to work, but to work hard, to work hard. It's not only that he do superficial work, but there is an idea of toiling, of working hard, putting your effort. Adam and Eve, when they were first created, God said to them, I'm going to put you into the Garden of Eden, I'm going to put you in and to work it and to guard it. Meaning that this was even before the sin of the snake. This was still while they were in the Garden of Eden, even it was in a beautiful garden before God kicked them out and said, oh man, now, now you're done because now you're going to have to work triply hard to make a living. Even in the beginning of it, La'avda Lashamra meant that they're going to have to keep the garden. You know, after whatever, whatever work needs to be done, God is expecting Adam and Eve to rise up to the occasion and do that work. And that's why God in the Ten Commandments said, six days shall you work, and on the seventh day you can rest. So from the Torah's perspective, a man, and I'm talking about mankind, both men and women, and everyone was put, were put down in this world in order to accomplish something through hard work. Meaning it's almost a mitzvah, just like it's a mitzvah to rest on Shabbos, because on Shabbos we, we're not allowed to work, at least all, the, all, all of the physical things that we do during the week. There's other work that we can do on Shabbos. We can study hard. We can pray better. You know, we could communicate with the family better. You know, it also takes work, you know, for some people. But the physical work and the outside work of the six days, it's prohibited on Shabbos. But for the other six days, it is prohibited not to do any work. You've got to, you've got to go to work. Which leads many people to ask this question, why? Why did God create the world in this way? I mean, why couldn't he just, you know, say everybody is going to be rich? Everybody is going to be rich. That's it. Finished. We're all, we're all, we're all going to be rich. Why not? Because you know what? Like Tevye says, I'm going to go back to, 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 the, uh, to the song, If I Were a Rich Man. And Tevye says, Oi, 
Would it spoil some vast eternal plan if I were a wealthy man? Would it bother anybody if I were a wealthy man? Who would it bother? Nobody. So why in the world? So philosophers have thought about this and they've come up with, basically we're gonna narrow it down to two reasons. Reason number one is self-respect, dignity, and pride, okay? We can't underestimate, ladies and gentlemen, how important these three aspects are when it comes to living a meaningful life and giving us self-esteem. Nobody that I know and nobody I think wants to be and sets out to be a taker. Now, circumstances may cause that for some odd reason that unluck, whatever it is, tragedy struck you, whatever, whatever the situation was, that you have to come on to somebody. You need help. You need help. Okay, I understand those are circumstances. But what, even those people would rather say to themselves, you know what, let me for a short time be a taker, get help from somebody, and then I want to get back on my feet. I want to get back on my feet. Why? Because every self-respecting person has dignity. And dignity tells us that, you know what, I don't want to get charity from somebody else. I don't want it. I, I don't want it. I don't like it. I don't want to be a taker. Think about the, 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 uh, the shame of the poor man when he has to come to the, to the, to the wealthy man to ask him for it. how shameful it is you him. I, I know not because I am a fundraiser, you know what, and uh, I, I'm raising money for a shul. I mean, it's a great cause and, and all of that. But still, it's uncomfortable. I mean, it, you know, to go and ask people for ask people for money. I would rather be the giver, right? And the Talmud says that a person would rather have one measure of his own hard work than nine measures given to him. Why? Because we want to feel as we want to feel like we're somebody. We want to feel like we earned it, earned it, always earned, nothing given. Remember that that sign somewhere. You know, it's always stuck in my mind. And let me, let me share with you at this time, just a personal story. When I was a teenager, so between the end of uh, school, which ended like in the middle of June and going to summer camp, which was a couple of weeks later, I got myself a job. I figured, you know, I'll make a little bit of money. I'll be able to take it to camp and, and spend it. So I got a job as a delivery boy to deliver newspapers, but not just regular newspapers. This was the Jewish community newspaper of Montreal, where you had to deliver each one to, to, to the front door. And that meant going into apartment buildings. So I organized a number of my friends and we all got together and got this job. And we spanned it across the, the city and we delivered papers from morning till evening was thousands of papers we had to deliver. Montreal, when I, when I was a kid, there was over 150,000 Jews. And so there were uh, uh, several thousand addresses that we had to cover and we did it and we made some money not as much as i thought we were going to make but at the end of the day i got some money with this money i went to a shop and i needed to get some equipment for camp i was going to be a counselor so i bought myself a knife a beautiful knife that i was going to use when we go on overnight hikes you know to cut the trees to do whatever it was it was a very very nice knife okay I come to camp, the first overnight, I'm there, I lose it. I don't know where it is. I wake up in the morning, it's gone. The knife is gone. I, you can't imagine, ladies and gentlemen, how bad I felt. I'm still having feelings. This is when I was, I don't know, 17 or 18 years old. You know, I'm in the 60s now. It's a long time ago. But as I'm telling this story, I still, I still get upset about that knife. It was a beautiful knife. But why, why did it upset me so much? Because I worked hard for it. I worked for that knife. Had my father just given me the 10 bucks, whatever it was, to go buy the knife, I would have, okay, I would have said, you know, no, 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 I lost it fine, and, you know, it's, you know. But because I sweated, and I put in all those days and days and days of delivering those papers, and finally making a few copicus, finally making a few cents and buying this knife, oh, now I felt like a million dollars. I had a knife hanging from me, and it was gone. I felt terrible. That proves to me what the Talmud says, that you would rather have 
I would rather have one measure of my own that made it feel like it was mine than nine that my father had given to me. Right? So this is this is an unbelievable lesson in life about the idea of dignity that God did not want to give us bread of shame, as he calls it. He didn't want to give us nothing um, or everything, I should say, because you know what? We would never, ever have appreciated this and we would never have grown up. We would never have matured. The worst thing that parents do to their children is give them everything. Whatever they ask for, they give them. I wish, I mean, I would be in that situation, but I would hope that even if I was capable of doing that, I wouldn't do that. Because what you do is you kill any incentive of work, kill any incentive of accomplishment. Now all you've done is entitlement. I, oh, I've raised children that think that the world is theirs. Everything must come to them. No, I remember clearly when Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha said that he's not leaving his billions to his children. I'm not worried about his children, don't get me wrong. I mean, his children are well taken care of, but he's not gonna leave them, he's not gonna leave them his billions of dollars because they're not, they're, they're, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, they know how to manage 50, 60, 70 billion dollars. No, they don't. And this is something that people have to understand that giving children challenges is a-okay. Not giving them everything is a-okay because what it does is it places in their mind this idea that things need to be earned. Go out there, earn it, and you'll appreciate it. You'll appreciate it much more. So reason number one why God didn't make everybody rich is because because he didn't, he wanted to instill in us, in the human being, the idea of self-sufficiency, the idea of dignity, that I went out there and I did it for myself and I accomplished. And you know what? And, and I always remember, I always remember that, you know what, now where the blessings come from, but still it gives me a sense of pride. It gives me a sense of self-respect that I know that I went out there and I did it. And I can, you know, and I can provide for my family rather than having God, you know, constantly put a, a, a money in my bank account. That's number reason number one. Reason number two is, how did God create this world? He worked at it. He absolutely worked at it. Meaning that whatever work really you can imagine, you know, in in in, in God's life. Need to say that, you know what, he went out there and he created the first day and the second day and the third day. Now, of course, we're not talking about physically hard. He wasn't, he wasn't sweating up, up in heaven, but he worked. He worked. He had a job. He built the world. And in this world, he put people. And why did he put people in this world? In order, in order to perfect it. Like I'd mentioned before about Adam and Eve, that he had placed them in the Garden of Eden. Why? To make sure that the garden would be perfect. Take away all the weeds, water it from time to time, make sure that the trees blossom and grow and fruit grow. Take care of it, right? Why? Because he was the one that made it and then gave the responsibility over to human beings that they should keep this beautiful garden intact, to guard it and to work it. So here, again, the second reason why God did not give us everything but makes us work hard for it is because he wants us to be godlike. We have to imitate God. One of the great mitzvahs of the Torah is to be like him. God is kind, we're kind. God is compassionate, we're compassionate. God is forgiving, we're forgiving. That's one of the greatest things that we, we have, you know, in, in, in Yiddishkeit and Judaism, that we are constantly trying to be holy and godlike. And this is the same thing true when it comes to work. When it comes to work and perfecting the world, as we go out there and we do a job, and again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, regardless of what this job is, whether it's this or that, a rabbi, a teacher, a, a mechanic, whatever it is, you are perfecting God's world. You are doing God's job. God created it. He made cars. Cars break down. Who needs to fix the cars? The mechanic. You are repairing God's world. Same thing is true. We're the gods. Take, take, take the people that pick up our refuse. Imagine that. You know, we look at them. And when I remember was a kid, my mother threatened me that if I don't get a good education, I'll be a garbage man. What? Try to live without them. If if they want on strike, you know what happens to this city? If those people go on strike, they provide a tremendous service for us. A tremendous service, you know, for us. They are also 
doing God's work. They are protecting this planet. This planet. They are guarding this planet. So work is an essential tool for a meaningful life. An essential tool. Because what you're doing is, ladies and gentlemen, it's not only a job and it's not only for the money, but you are godlike in the fact that you are you in your little corner of the world, wherever that is, in the little corner of the world, you are actually doing God's work. And if you're doing God's work and you understand and appreciate that you're doing God's work, then how is it not that work is not meaningful? It of course becomes meaningful. And even more so when we talk about volunteerism, you know, when you know when 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 someone and someone goes out there and it doesn't have to work anymore, is retired and could spend the rest of his time, you know, sitting at home and watching or reading and just taking and he goes and they go out there and they volunteer. Look, think about that, ladies and gentlemen. That is truly God's work. Truly God's, you know, God's work. The Rebbe, Lubava Rebbe, when he was 80 years old, was asked, when is he going to retire? He was, and this was 1982. He hit 80. And the Rebbe quoted this verse from Eve and said, man was made to toil when I'm, I'm, I'm going to retire at 80. As long as I have a breath that I can accomplish something, my responsibility is to accomplish. My, 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 my destiny is not to sit back. And even though the Rebbe could have spent plenty of time learning and he had plenty of things to do, if he didn't have to run the community, didn't have to worry about the world, world Chabad uh, movement. But still, he said, absolutely not. And, and from 80 until he was 90, he was every day in the office working, you know, working and working and working and working more and more and more and expecting us to do more and more and more because he understood that work, whatever it is, is God's work. And you become more holy and more godly. And then by extension, it's meaningful. So now, let's put aside work. We've tackled work, and now we know how to get out there and to, to do a meaningful job. Now let's talk about money. Money, money, money. Ay, 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 ay. Money, money, money. When people are asked, why do you need money? Why do you want money? Why are you willing to go out there and fight and fight and fight and sacrifice yourself for money, money, money? What do you need the money for? Why do I need money for? I need money because it's buying power. I want to be able to afford a Peloton, you know, that, that fancy bikes that you, the exercise bikes. I want a Tesla. I want money. It's buying power and buying power. Ay, ay, ay. Value. Look at me. Look at me. I'm rich. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. Security. I don't have to worry about anything else. Oh, look at that. All of these things, ladies and gentlemen, is quite normal here in the United States of America. When asked what is the business of America, our president once said, way back when, the business of America is business. This is what we were founded for. We're a capitalistic society that we know we're here, we're in business. People are out there and they're fighting to make a living. And we have given everybody the opportunity to go out there and strive and fight and, and invest as much as you want. And if you want to make a million, you want to make a billion, go ahead, go right ahead. And if you do it for greedy purposes, we, we don't, that's not, uh, not, in the constitution, there's nothing against greed. Nothing against greed, ladies and gentlemen. You go out there and do, do whatever you like. Now, what happens, the downside of that is, is that, of course, you lose perspective. You lose perspective. So you're successful. God granted your wish. You want money for the value, it makes you feel good, or you want it for the security or the buying power. So now God gave it to you and said, you know what, that's great. You know what, here, here's, here, here's the millions. Let, let's see what happens. So what happens to many people? They lose perspective. First of all, they be, be, begin to believe in themselves and turn arrogant. Look at me. Look at me. I made all this. I made all this. I made all this money for myself. Wow! Well, look at look at look at this. They forget that the blessing comes comes from the Almighty, right? They forget about they forget about all of that all of that stuff. So there, you know, there there comes there comes the first challenge, you know, of uh, you know of success. That right away, it's all about me. It's all about me. I did it. I made it. Forget about it. My second part is their whole identity is now tied into their into, into their money. There's nothing else except the money. It becomes corrupt. It becomes it becomes not only does it become not satisfaction. It becomes a tumult in their lives. 
Now you have it. Now you got to keep it. Now everybody knows that you have money. Now wants a piece of you, including your family. So your whole life, you're all now wrapped up in the fact that, no, you have to control this. So you become a control freak, you know, and then you'll argue with your family. I've been in this business of the rabbinate for 40 years. And I see it most times that families fight, it's over money. Poor families never seem to fight. I don't know. Then. Is what, what's, what's there to fight about? But rich families seem to be fighting all over money. Why? Because they lost their perspective of the money, what the money is supposed to do. Yes, it's great to have it. It's wonderful to have it. But if it's going to control you to the point of where you're nobody except for that money, that you're nothing except for that money, well, what good is that money then for? I mean, if it's going to cause such heartache. Really? Is it worth it? Let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, is it worth it that you'll be alone at the end of the day, but you'll have the money? You'll have the money. No, no. There's another purpose to this money. Let me just in, let me just advocate for this. King David once said, God, why don't you create everybody equal? Make everybody equal. You know, either rich or poor. Okay? Make everybody rich or poor. So God said to him, if I did that, who would ever do any kindness? Kindness, chesed, extending yourself to somebody. Who would ever do that? We, we would never, right? We would never do that. If everybody was rich and had any, everything that they needed, there would never be in the world a sense of kindness towards each other. We would never do anything for each other because we wouldn't need each other. So God said, no, it can't work that way. We need to have people that need and the people that have. And the people that have, I'm expecting them. They're my partners. I'm, I've, I've, I've invested in them the idea that they will take from what they have and share with somebody else in a dignified manner. This is what we call tzedakah. Tzedakah is righteousness. It's the right thing to do. In America, we call it charity. But in reality, it's called tzedakah. It's called something righteous. Why? Because God trusted you. He said, you know what? I believe you're a good person and you will do the right thing. So here you are. Here you are. Here it is. Take it. And now I, what I want you to do is to share it. Give it to help, help, help other people with it. If that is your approach to money, if that is why you say to yourself, you know what? I need a lot of money because I'd like to really help as many people as I possibly can. Money should never be your identity. That's not who you are. You are a living, breathing human being with a soul. Money is a secondary aspect to you. Now you could use that, and it's a wonderful thing to have to make this world a better place. And when you do that, guess what? It makes you have a much more meaningful life, much more meaningful life. You know, and of course, look, we all we always we always want to be the ones that are giving rather than than the receiving. Of course, we we understand that, but that's also a tremendous responsibility. You know the old Jack Benny joke. You know he's held up, and he, the guy says, "Your money or your life." Well, the thief says, "So Benny, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Why? Because his money became so important. And it's a joke. Everybody laughs. Yeah, 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 yeah. But unfortunately, too many people fall into that trap and forget about the idea of the kindness." aspect of it of the giving aspect of it of is what we we makes us a mensch what happens makes us a mensch and that is why god created the world in this manner that some will have and some are, are going to be needy and the haves are going to help the have nots i remember one time when a group of the rebbe's emissaries went into the rebbe with a proposal and they said to the rebbe that you know what instead of every one of us centers chabad centers you know, going out there and raising money, and sometimes it's difficult, and you know, in, in a recession, extremely difficult. COVID becomes more difficult. We want to start a business, and we'll be successful. And from the proceeds of the business, we'll allocate it to each Chabad center around the country. And the Rebbe nixed it. The Rebbe said, "No, I don't want. I am not interested in this. Why? Because number one, you don't know if you're going to be successful. Number two, if you're going to be successful, and administer the money properly, and then give everybody what they need, they're never going to go out to ask for money from. And this wealthy man who's now waiting for this rabbi Perlmutter to knock on his door and say to him, Mr. Cohen, 
Mr. Cohen, I'm here, Rabbi Perlmutter, from the from Shul by the Shore. We are an organization here in Long Beach, and we need your help. If Rabbi Perlmutter gets everything that he needs, you know, from a central office, he's never going to approach Mr. Cohen or Mr. Teitelbaum, you know, or Mr. Finkelstein or Mr. Silverman. And these people are waiting for him, waiting for him to ask. Now, I I want to believe that they're waiting for me to ask. I got to just go out there and, you know, and make that happen. But, but the Rebbe was saying that there's a, an idea of kindness that these wealthy people need to, ex, to exude, need to show. And if no one is going to give them the opportunity, certainly us, the Chabad rabbis, if we're not going to be able to go to them and say to them, hey, you know what? I need your help. I want your help. They're not going to be able to fulfill their destiny. So the Talmud says, believe me, more than the wealthy person does for the poor person, the poor person does for the wealthy person. Now, you think to yourself, is that correct? More than the wealthy does for the poor, the poor do for the wealthy. How so? He says, because the poor received the money. What he, what the wealthy guy did something, but what the poor guy did for the wealthy guy is he allowed him to fulfill his destiny. Imagine that. He, he The rich guy had this, this largesse of cash that needed to be distributed, and this poor person, the recipient, is the one that allowed the wealthy person to, 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 to fulfill his destiny and live a meaningful life. That is in itself a great mitzvah, okay? So here, when it comes to money, there's two ways to go. There's the one way of going, I got this pot and I'm going to surround myself and that's going to be it, close the door, or I have this pot and this pot is for sharing. This pot is for making the world a better place. And that's why Maimonides Rambam, who writes, you know, uh, the, the, you know the, the book on Jewish law, put in there the laws of giving charity. And charity is called the mitzvah. In the Talmud, it's called the mitzvah. Why? Because charity is almost a giving away a part of you. Because you work so hard for it. You labor for it. You know, it's not it's not something you some inherited, but for many, they work for it. And when you give away something, you're giving away your neshama, you're giving away a piece of you. That's why it is such an important mitzvah that, you know, if you put on the scale with the other mitzvahs, it weighs almost equally a, 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 the amount is because it is such an essential part of you that you give away. It's unbelievable how you know you know you know charitable charitable people what what they do and they're able to accomplish with charity. I mean, the mere words cannot explain. This world would not wouldn't be able to exist without charitable people. And that's why Maimonides writes that there are eight levels of giving charity, and I think it would be important to share them, you know, with everybody because I know that there are many people that are watching this and they're going to be watching this are charitable are charitable by themselves and it's you know it's a it's something very interesting so i have here listed the eight levels the greatest level says no greater is to support your fellow by endowing him with a gift or a loan and entering a partnership with him finding employment with him putting him up on his feet in order to assist him he no longer needs to be dependent upon on this so the first mitzvah, the highest level of charity is not giving money. The highest level of charity is taking somebody and putting them on their feet. That's number one. That's the greatest. Either a loan, a partnership, somehow help this guy out that he doesn't have to become dependent upon somebody else. A lesser level, lower than that is, to give charity to the poor without knowing to whom one gives and without the recipients knowing who received this. So neither one knows you know what, because the recipient not knowing, I understand because the shame, eh, you know what, you have to know. The, the rich guy not knowing, I understand because he doesn't have a boastful, you know, he walks by the guy's house and he says, oh, you know what, in his mind, I, I'm supporting this guy. So if neither knows who it is, that's the, that's the best way. I don't know that I give you, you don't know that you're receiving it from me, and, that's, um, and, and we, keep, we keep going on. That's num lesson num le le level number two. Two, a lesser level is when no one, when one knows to whom one gives, but the recipient does not know his benefactor. Okay, so you know you're giving it, but the recipients don't know. So you don't, you're, you're not making them ashamed, you know, like in sticking in front of them. So you know what, give it to them. They'll never know. You know that they're getting it, but they don't know where it's coming from. So then no shame, no shame. That's level number three. You know, but they don't know. A lesser level than this is one who does not know to one who gives, but the poor person does know. 
meaning that, you know what, uh, you throw a 10 bucks behind you and someone goes, picks it up. So you don't know who you gave to, but he knows. He knows, you know. Well, so this, 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 is, this is a lesser level than the one that beforehand where the other one didn't know and, and you knew. Okay, so that's four, okay? A lesser level than this is when one gives to the poor directly in his hand, but before he asks, Meaning that there's a little bit of shame there, you know, because he knows that you're helping him. The rich guy yeah, feels good about himself, but he didn't have to be asked. So that already took away some of the hurt from the poor person. So level number five is you give it to him in his hand. You know he knows that you're helping him, but you didn't, you didn't make him crawl to you. You didn't have to go begging to you. You know, you, you did it very nicely. You said, you know what, I know you need some help. Here it is. A lesser level on this is one gives to the poor after being asked. Meaning, you know what? You made the guy ask you. It took a lot of it took a lot of hurt from the guy. He's ashamed. He's humiliated. But he needs the money. His children need clothing. He needs food on his table. So he comes to you and he asks you for the money. Can you give it to him? Fine. But you waited until you waited until you were asked. Another level less lesser than this is one gives less than one should, but he does it gladly. Meaning that you know what? I could give a hundred dollars. To this guy, but I'm going to give him 50, but I do it happily. You know what? Okay, and it's not everything, but you know, you're not embarrassing this guy. You're not embarrassing this guy. Another level, and this is the lowest level, you give less and you give it to him in a mean face. Oh, so not only have you not given what you should be given, but not only did you wait till he asked you, but you actually made him feel bad. Like he's like he's like he's taking it out of your out of out of, out of your veins. It's like giving him the blood, you know, from your veins. That's the lowest level. Now, even the lowest level, the lowest level, Maimonides counts this, you know, as 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 charity. But still, but still, it's not the same as you know as as giving in the other cases. But but let 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 it be said that even the guy that gives less and he does it with a sour face. Is better than the guy that never doesn't give it at all. So here, ladies and gentlemen, what Maimonides is is doing is giving us all the opportunities to do what we need to do with our money. Now, of course, you need to take care of your family, and of course, you need to have a roof over your head, and of course, the Torah says that don't be silly and give away all of your money. But there's a certain percentage that you need to give away, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is what makes the difference in how you approach money in a meaningful way. That's it. So you want to live a meaningful life, you know, with money, 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 money. We all want that money. And like I, I had advertised before, people jumping for the dollars and they'll go crazy for anything for money. No problem. Accumulate the money. Go out there, do it honestly, without stealing, without, you know, with, 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 without deception. Go ahead there, make as much money. But remember this. Remember this, that you, you, you are the one that controls the money, not the money controls you. Okay? We have so many we have so many lessons from the Torah, but I want to talk about one. I want to talk about one. Joseph. Joseph, you know, was a brother that was sold down to Egypt. We all know this story. And in Egypt, he became extremely wealthy. Huh? He became the viceroy. He ran the show. Pharaoh said to him, you know what? You're going to go out there and you're going to uh, run the show for me. That's it. You're just going to go out there and run the show for me. Great. Then his brothers show up. Joseph sees his brothers. Now, there's a number of different ways Joseph could have, could have acted. One way he could have acted has been mean. And he would have had every right look. They sold him down to Egypt. They didn't come search for him. Now they come and they need food. Now they come. So Joseph... Through a, through a plays a little game with them, but ultimately, you know, he brings Benjamin down and he reveals himself to his brothers and he treats them royally. Why? Because Joseph is a prime example of someone that made it. He made it. Millionaire. Maybe even a billionaire in, you know, in those days. And I could have done everything I could to hurt my brothers. I could have, but I didn't. Why? Because we call him Yosef HaTzadik. Joseph the Righteous. That dad did the ultimate right thing when, when, when he took his brothers in and provided for them. Forget about how he provided for the rest of the world. That's great. That's wonderful. But he did not let the money go to his head. He didn't think of himself. Hey, look at me. I'm an Egyptian now. I made myself billions here in, you know, in in in, in Egypt. 
I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. You know, you're foreigners from a different place. I left when I was a kid. I don't want to know you. No, no. He kept everything in perspective and believed that this is God sent them. And he said this to his brothers over and over again, that God sent me here. You did not send me here. I'm, I'm here for a purpose. And my purpose is to be the sustainer of you and your families. He lived a meaningful life. Joseph lived a meaningful life. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, our challenge. That is our challenge for work and for money. You know what? Thank God we live in a country where there's still opportunity. We could go out there. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. But you know what? We go out there and we work. Today, in today's day and age, you know, with COVID, a lot of us are working from home. It's a little bit more challenging. That's another layer of challenge, you know, to this. But nonetheless, one day we will go back hopefully to normal, and we'll go back into the office, we'll go back to whatever we did. Please keep in mind all those things about work and money. But work and money are two vehicles that God gave to us to enhance and better our lives, to make this world a better place, and all those around us to make them better. So there's a challenge. At the end of every day, I'd like you to ask yourself this question, ladies and gentlemen. Am I using all of my God-given resources to produce more, to produce more than what was given to me? Am I doing that? If you can answer yes, you are well on your way towards a meaningful life. If you can harness those two things, money and work, and say to yourself every day that I am putting out more into the world than what's coming to me, that I am making this world a better place and I'm going to leave this world a better place, that without me there would be a void out there in the world and you could say, yes, I am doing that, then ladies and gentlemen, you have listened to this lesson and you have taken the lessons personally, which of course is the hardest challenge of all because you know when we say something, it's like always the case is I'm, he's not talking to me because I'm, I'm already doing this, but I'm talking to everybody, and myself included up my game, to make it even more meaningful, to be more charitable, to be more aware at work that I can do things to make everybody around me better. I don't have to be the boss. I don't have to be the president of the company. I don't need to be the CEO. I can be one of the guys in, in a cubicle over there. But if I come into work every day and people know that he's a cheerful guy, he's a friendly guy, he's a, he's a, he's a faithful person, then you know what? All of a sudden you make a tremendous impact on people a tremendous impact on people. And not only do you make an impact, but you actually elevate the entire situation, the entire situation. And that's what we're here for, ladies and gentlemen, to make this world whole and you become holy. So here we are at the witching hour. So I hope that I've been able to touch upon some important points this evening and take that aspect now, because the past few weeks we've been dealing with our inside, inside our home, with our loved ones. Today, we went outside into the world, but that's our responsibilities as well. As long as we're humans, as long as we're breathing, as long as we're here on earth, we have a job to accomplish. And whether we're 20 or 40 or 60 or 80 or 100, we're still breathing. God expects us to do what's right. To guard this world and make it a better place to live for everybody, regardless of who, what, when, and where. Thank you all very much. Next week, I'm so sorry, by the way, I have to apologize for all the difficulties in the beginning. I'm not sure who came on and who didn't come on. I have no idea what happened. Usually this has been a smooth operation, you know, uh, you know, until now. Must somebody must have touched a button. I when I say somebody, see, right away, somebody. It must have been me. I must have touched a button, you know, and it didn't work. But I hope that everybody that wanted to get on got on. Next week, we are going to be dealing with a subject that is not so happy. We're going to be dealing with challenges and how people deal with loss and sometimes suffering and how we deal with that to make it more, to make our lives more meaningful. But until, until that time, ladies and gentlemen, I want to wish you a good evening. Please, as always, I say, if you like this, please share it. If you liked it, make a comment. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up. Uh, whatever, whatever it is, it means a lot to me because it shows me somehow that I'm actually connecting. I've told you once, I've told you a, a thousand times, my, I, 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 this is not my forte. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it, 
and I like Facebook, don't get me wrong, and uh, I pre try to prepare as much as I possibly can, but I love an in-house crowd. When people are sitting around, this is, this is, this is what I've done all my years, and I, and I love it. So I thank you so much for joining me here this evening. I wish I could say everybody's name down here, but there's, there's so many that have, that, have, that have chimed in to thank you so much for, you know, you know, for coming. And again, have a wonderful, safe week. Stay healthy. We're still not out of the woods with this coronavirus. So do what you have to do. Wear a mask. You know, uh, stay situated six feet away, whatever it is. Please come join me in Chalaya tomorrow at 6 o'clock. Also, my Torah class for the week that's on Torah Treasures Thursday at 10 o'clock. No, I'm sorry, 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock, you know, noon. And uh, our pre-Shabbos L'chaim and message at 2 o'clock on Friday. Until that, until we see each other again, ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful evening and shalom.